Right, okay. Um, <clears throat> now that we're recording, I think we should do the introductions first. I'm Kevin Houston. I'm one of TMIP, Talking Maths in Public, and uh, I'm also the Education Secretary of the London Mathematical Society and a lecturer at the University of Leeds. So uh, and then I'll hand over to Sam. Do you want to introduce yourself and then down the chain, as it were? Yeah, so I'm Sam Durbin. I am usually based at the Royal Institution where I manage our secondary maths masterclass programme. So I work with partners all across the UK to run workshops. Um, I'm on furlough at the moment, so I'm not doing that, but I am also one fourth of the team it team. So I've been filling up my time with doing things like this. Can I, I, should, I could jump in. Uh, so I'm Katie Stuckles. I am a mathematician who does public engagement part-time freelance and part-time I teach at Sheffield Hallam University. And uh, I do far too many different things, including being one of the members of the team at committee. Which leaves Ben. Uh, yeah, I'm Ben Sparks. I was a secondary maths teacher for 10 years. I now work for the Advanced Maths Support Programme or AMSP based in the University of Bath. That's where I'm based anyway, for half of my time. And the other half of my time, I'm freelance doing maths communication, teacher training and outreach in general, occasionally for myself, occasionally with Maths Inspiration and Rob Eastaway and Matt Parker, and occasionally on the Number File YouTube channel, much like some other people on our committee. And I'm also part of the TMIP committee, which is why I'm speaking now. Uh, except I've stopped. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, every every week we do this and we don't pass it between each other um, properly, do we? We should, um, we should each give a slightly different introduction each week so that anyone who comes to all of them can find out more facts about us. I'm still <laughs> learning about my own job here, let alone telling everyone. <laughs> when you have this sort of meeting, you need to, when you're doing the introductions, you, you need to pass the ball on, as it were, to people rather than wait for the, uh, the host to say, now you, now you, now you. Right. Okay, anyway, so welcome everybody to, um, we've got a, a session today on um, putting events that, uh, that were real events uh, online. So, um, so a lot of the sort of face-to-face -face STEM festivals um, uh, are gonna have to switch to online events. So we've got three speakers today who come from different sort of uh, areas who, who are dealing with this problem in um, different ways. Uh, so we've invited them to share their plans for their online events and uh, their experience of how it's all going and how it's all, um, how it's probably all very stressful, I would imagine. Um, so after that, we'll have a Q&A, um, which uh, then at about four o'clock, uh, well, actually, if we, if, if, we, um, if we have the time, then we might go into breakout rooms. But so far, uh, during these sessions, we've never had the time to do that. But anyway, so um, Q&A and then about three o'clock, we will stop uh, the actual proper session and then afterwards, so you've got a chance to leave. But uh, after, sorry, not three o'clock, at four o'clock. At four o'clock, we will stop um, and allow people a chance to leave. And then you can, those who want to stay can stay and we'll have a little half hour session afterwards. Okay, so we are recording the speakers and the Q&A. So uh, if you want to ask a question, but don't want to speak on the recording, uh, and you do have a question, you can use the chat, which you should be able to find just by clicking the little button down the bottom. Um, or you can send a private message to Ben, I think, who was doing the Q&A. Uh, and uh, it, well, anyway, someone will ask the question for you. Right, so we uh, do have a code of conduct, which I hope you've all read and is available on our website. So if you've not seen it, you can, Go there now, um, talkingmathsinpublic.uk, to read the uh, code of conduct. So, but basically, it's uh, you should be welcoming and polite, considerate and respectful, and all those sorts of things. Uh, use gender-neutral language, um, so you're not saying, "Oh, come on, guys," all the time, like Ben. Um, and people here will be will be sharing things, um, but so. Uh, please don't share other people's uh, stuff. You know, don't 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 force people to to share if they don't want to. Um, just ask if you want to share anything beyond that. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is going to hand over to uh, Sam to introduce our speakers. Okay, Sam. All right, hello everyone. Um, I believe it's Katie doing the Q and A this week, so um, we swap every week what we're doing. So if you don't want to put something in the public chat, but you do want the question asked, you can drop it in a private message to Katie. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, three speakers. 
So today we've got people coming from big events that they're doing with a variety of different audiences. So we've got Marika Navin, who looks after Chatham Science Festival, which is a public audience. We've got Katie Oldfield, who um, coordinates Maths Week Scotland, and they've changed their audience this year to just focus on schools. And Ashley Kent, who looks after the big event, which we'll explain a little bit more um, when it gets to that, for those of you who don't know what that is, but that is an event for science or STEM communicators. So very different audiences, but all of them have had to take an event that should have happened in the real world and move it to an online setting due to all of the things that have been happening. So we're going to kick off with Marika. She has a PhD in chasing neutrinos in an underground mine in Japan, which sounds very exciting and probably wasn't as exciting as it sounds. Um, she was also runner up in the FameLab Science Communication Competition in 2007 and returns to Cheltenham Science Festival every year with a family show and basically hang around until they gave her a job. So she's been organising or been head of the science programming at Cheltenham Science Festival since 2019 and that festival is due to start in just 11 days. So we're really really grateful that she's given up the time to be here with us this afternoon because I can't imagine how busy she is at the moment. So um, Marike over to you to tell us a little bit more about the festival. I mean, how has it worked to try and move a face-to-face -face festival online at such short notice? Thank you, Sam. So, um, it, where we were in our festival cycle, um, what we do is we do our core sort of programming between the months of August and December, which means that January is all about tying up all the loose ends, getting the program all boxed off, and then February, and then actually we, we had finished the brochure. It was something like the first week of March. It got sent to the printers. So the brochure got totally finished, signed off for the 2020 festival about a week before lockdown. <laughs> oh, it was really close. So it was like, oh my God, you know, I've got this full festivals ready to go. Basically the next job would have been then, you know, organizing all the events and all the ops and, doing all of the health and safety and all of that but we had this like beautiful which I, I think is just going to be you know when no one's ever going to see it this brochure I'm going to just kind of when I get my hands on one just like stroke it and you know keep it on my shelf no one's ever going to see it so it's quite sad and then we at Charlton Festivals we're absolutely brilliant at putting on a festival village and building tents and putting on great live events we're really really good at that in terms of digital we're not that we're not really that great we don't have a brilliant digital reach um and it's something that the festivals have wanted to work on for many many years like you know like everyone always talks about improving their digital reach and reaching more audiences digitally and even when i went for the job interview sort of two years ago one of the things they asked me was you know what can i bring to the table on reaching new digital audiences so when it kind of all kicked off that the festival was going to have to get cancelled the sort of initial reaction from Cheltenham Festivals was very much it's cancelled. Um, we'll see you in 2021. And we haven't, we actually do four festivals at Cheltenham and we, our biggest festival is the Literature Festival and that takes place in October. So a lot of the sort of first reaction was let's do something at, lit, at Literature Festival in October. But I don't know about you lot, like I was like as if events are going to be up in October, but at this point, back in sort of March, nobody was really saying that. It, the kind of, kind of the party mood was like, this lockdown would be quite temporary. Um, you know, everyone was talking about in the autumn, but I just never really went in for that. I, I was just like, I couldn't really say it because obviously everyone who works on the literature festival at my organization didn't want to hear that either. <laughs> so I was very much like, mm, yeah, okay, <laughs> autumn, whatevs. Um, and also I didn't really want to just cancel because at the end of the day, we're a science festival. So if a science festival can't raise, you know, rise to a challenge, um, using tech and innovation, then, you know, you're not exactly a very good science festival, are you? So it was kind of like me, I drove it really to be like, guys, you want, I'm oh, sorry, I've just said guys, folks, <laughs> you want to for years you've been saying you want to improve your digital reach prove it 
let's do it. Everyone's, you know, everyone's going to be interacting digitally now. If we're not going to take this opportunity, then why are we even bothering? So I kind of put a case towards it and we just, me and the team just sort of scoped out sort of a test festival where it was really easy for us because we already had the program right there. So we could just go through the program and just be like, this will work digitally. This could work digitally. So the very, the next step then was talking to mainly two sets of people, which was one, the scientists and science communicators and artists and providers that we were already booked to come in the festival to see if they were interested in talking about moving to a, an online digital platform. So that was the first thing. And then secondly was having that conversation with our corporate sponsors to see whether they wanted to come with us on a digital journey. So the development team had to go and do all that. We had to go and talk to all our scientists and our, you know, all our speakers that we booked in. Um, I put together, you know, like a draft schedule. Um, and again, I had to fight for it a bit. We, we, we were running the festival same dates. Um, the first thing everyone at the, at the organization wanted to do was like, oh, we'll just do one day. I think looking back, I can't remember now why I was so opposed to that because that would have been a heck of a lot easier <laughs> to, to organize and manage. But I was really against it. I was like, these are the festival dates. You know, we kept it really simple in that it was only one event at a time, not parallel events. So it's a really small subset of events. In the end, I think we've had about 60 events. I've not, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head now how many events we've gone for in the end, but it's around about 60. And in the festival, normally we'd probably have about 230. So, um, cause we've got loads of different venues. I should have probably explained a bit more about Cheltenham Science Festival for those who've not been, but we have a um, big tented village basically at the town hall in Cheltenham over six days. Um, it's mostly ticketed events. Um, and then we have a lot of free hands-on stuff in that festival village. Um, so our audiences are families, kids, intergenerational groups, a big schools program throughout the week and then interested adults and science comedy and all that jazz so back to the online we straight away the schools were closed so we didn't want to we, we definitely put the schools program to bed i thought i felt like that was too complicated and we work with lots and lots of local schools but they were all closed so i kind of wanted to leave that so we just focused on families and adults um, so everyone went away, we did the, all the talks with the providers, we did the talks with the sponsors and the sponsors were really up for it. They, um, we lost a few and we lost some big companies who are looking at like redundancies, you know, who had, was, had ceased operations around the, around the world. Everyone was worried about job security. They really, they had to pull back um, some funding. So we lost, we lost a few sort of big names. But um, for the most part, they'd already committed to the, to the sponsorship, so they didn't want to pull out, which was obviously brilliant. And I think for the most part, the sponsors were also interested in this online journey and trying something new and reaching different audiences, because obviously, Science Festival like Cheltenham, you've got a number of barriers. First of all, ge geographical, and second of all, financial. Um, and you know that whole thing about whether even a science festival is for you or whether you would even hear about it or whatever so everyone's really kind of interested in this now digital audience can be worldwide you know we we don't really know what we're going to get um obviously i'm like petrified what if nobody tunes in what if nobody watches but you know i know and my other fear as well is um it's not just 200 people in a tent in cheltenham now it could be potentially massive audiences all over the world you know something goes wrong so that's a bit of nervousness so yeah so then at some point we all the stars aligned and we decided that we have enough we had enough sponsorship support we had enough support from speakers that we would go and I managed to persuade everyone that we would stick to the same dates we would do stuff you know all day every day um and now the program has been announced we we announced the program on Monday so it's out there so I think somebody put the link um, in the chat so do check it out do subscribe to our YouTube channel if you can um, and yeah fingers crossed I can't remember now if I've covered everything you wanted me to cover so let me know if pretty much a couple of questions from what you were talking about um, how what you know what 
what are you using to host the events and how are you doing yeah. things like booking? Yes, yeah. so the tech side of things. So we're working with sort of a sort of a technical partner, if you like, and it's only a small company in Cheltenham um, called Still Moving Media. And they are always at the festival. They've been involved in all the festivals for years and they would always make us like a festival video, you know, on the site, film snapshots of loads of different events and put us this nice video together. So that company has been basically our technical partner. And we did have, um, obviously at the beginning, we didn't know what would be the best thing to do. So working with them, we decided, and this is what we're doing, is um, we, did, we wanted to do pre-records. So everyone at the organization, because they were so nervous in any case about moving to the digital, that there was no way, they were all panicking about um, you know, doing live events and having that sort of technical know-how in-house to deal with that. And I know you had Trent, um, at this meeting, was it last week or the week before, who's done the Stay at Home Festival and his festival is, you know, totally live and, you know, total respect to them for that, but there was no way I could get that signed off. So um, we're doing pre-records, so we're in the midst now of all the pre-records and we're doing them mostly over Zoom. But what's proven really tricky was the guy at Still Moving Media said, right, this is what we're going to do. You will, f uh, so say we're just doing like an in-conversation, the panellists will come on Zoom, um, and do the whole event over Zoom and Cheltenham Science Festival can record that Zoom same way as you guys do. But that Zoom recording is actually pretty low quality in the end and that wouldn't be what you would want to then broadcast on your YouTube channel. So every speaker has to record themselves on a separate device. So what we mostly ask people to do is just to get their phone and then like perhaps put a pile of books behind their laptop so their phone's just there. So they're talking to both the devices they hit record on their phone and so everyone on the panel sends us the phone recordings we send the zoom and then the guy's going to stitch it all together um sounds easy right doesn't it mm. <laughs> i can't tell you literally what a nightmare it's been because we do every event and there's always one speaker that's like oh i didn't read the you know advice that that's what you want just to do oh i haven't got a phone oh, I haven't got a camera, oh, I haven't got a laptop. It's just like one thing after another. And then when you do get them to get their phone recording, at the end of the event, they're like, oh, I've only got three minutes of that. <laughs> it's just like literally one thing after another. So I'm just like, we should have done it live. We just should have done it live. Instead, we're going to have all these really, really bad pre-records. So that's where I am at the moment in just trying to hold my nerve that it's going to look okay because um, it feels like the pre-records actually aren't going that well from my perspective, um, just with those challenges of, of the tech, really. Interesting. Those are, are different challenges to what you'd have with a, a live event, and it's going to be very interesting to, I think, work through. No, we, you know, we've not done this before. No one's done this before. So it is a bit of an experiment. And that's what's really nice about Science Festival, because that's a, a place where you can just like tr try things out, test things out, um, and the audiences at science festivals are always really forgiving. You know, they're there to have fun. They're there to enjoy themselves. And obviously in this case, it's free as well. So I'm just hoping the audience are going to be really forgiving that, you know, we've, <laughs> we've done the best that we can. <laughs> and I right. just hope they enjoy the event. I'm sure they will. Thank you so much, Marika. It's really interesting to hear it all from your perspective and hear what's going on. Um, we're going to move on to talk to Katie Oldfield now, who is Maths Week Scotland coordinator. She's based at Ma National Museum Scotland and has a background in science communication and public engagement. She's previously worked at Edinburgh Science and Dynamic Earth, both lovely places to, to go and visit um, if you are up in that neck of the woods. And she engages with universities and other partners all across Scotland to not just run stuff during Maths Week, but run stuff during the whole of the year as well. So it's a, a really interesting and mixed set of things that she does. Um, I worked with her with my, my other hat on and she's been brilliant at connecting all the different partners that do things across Scotland and encouraging us to do stuff together and work together as well. So um, she's obviously facing the challenges of what to do about Maths Week, which is due to take place in October, I believe, Katie? Yeah, it's the end of September, start of October. Um, oh, thank you. That's such a lovely introduction, Sam. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so um, my name is Katie and I'm the Maths Week Scotland coordinator. So 
Um, Master Meet Scotland is a, um, a slightly different model from um, the kind of science festival model um, that, that we were hearing about there. So Mass Week Scotland, we do events throughout the year um, and then we have a week of focused activity from the 28th of September to the 4th of October. Um, we are a super small team in that it is me, it's not a we, it's just an I, um, working with really great support from an advisory group um, and, and various other groups um, behind me. Uh, and then the kind of model of Maths Week itself is working with organisations, with collaborators and contributors um, around Scotland. So places like science festivals, museums, universities, STEM ambassadors, loads of different organisations um, that all um, incredibly kindly and very successfully do events and activity for Maths Week Scotland that we kind of bring under one banner and try and sort of link together um, to kind of create a nationwide um, thing of uh, activity um, all across Scotland. Uh, we have quite a wide audience base. School early years and schools um, have always been our primary audience. In the last couple of years, um, we've been building on the adult audience. Um, so that's been that's been something we've worked that we've worked up. Um, we've also always had quite a lot of kind of resources and things for people to use and really encouraged Mass Week to be kind of like a grassroots fit. It's kind of a funded grassroots is <laughs> the best way I can think to describe the model. Um, so lots of schools do different celebrations and it's always been quite creative um, from organizations. Um, so where we were in our kind of cycle was um, my, my kind of downtime is sort of November, December, January, and then February, we were just starting to gear up for um, a peak of activity over April, May and June, um, and then a bit of a lull ahead of September and October. So um, it, the initial response was that all of my lovely events for April, May and June just got wiped out. Um, so that was kind of the first thing um, to have to try and have a look at. Um, I was probably slightly luckier in that Maths Week was far enough away that I didn't have set events for that um, at the moment. So in terms of our initial things that we um, had planned that we had to adapt to, um, we have adapted quite a lot of our resources because I work at the um, National Museum Scotland, uh, we do a lot of things for schools and visitors, so sort of trails and activities that they can do when they visit our sites. So um, we spent a bit of time, um, I spent a bit of time with colleagues changing those um, activities people would do on site to work for what they can do at home. So pulling out the activities that would work wherever, rewriting things um, and putting them onto a central hub. So that was sort of part of our first response to not events people would do online, but events people would do in person, but activities people would do in person. Um, we also had some lovely women in maths things planned in May. Um, so what we did instead, we were going to do some events and we were going to go into various workplaces and speak to women that use maths as part of their core um, and uh, then have that on Women in Maths Day on the 12th of May. So instead what we've done is um, put together some films. So we have asked people to film themselves answering questions at home that we've then made into videos with things going alongside them. Um, and that's, that, that's in progress, but that's working quite well. And it has kind of meant, so the, the, we've got a couple coming tomorrow and we got like the Cabinet Secretary for Finance um, in Scotland to do it, who we probably wouldn't have got to come along to an event, I suspect. <laughs> but um, she has done this like lovely video and we've got quite a lot of people that I think, you know, we, we maybe wouldn't, wouldn't have got if we weren't doing it in this format so that's been a real kind of nice advantage and we've been able to kind of reach more people by creating these digital resources and also we plan to use these as like a bank of things that we can also use during maths week as well so that that's kind of been something that's um been really useful and then looking ahead to maths week um scotland 2020 um as sam said uh, we decided to stick with the dates, 28th of September to the 4th of October, um, and we have reduced our um, audience. So we, we're sticking with schools and kind of existing community groups um, as our kind of main focus. 
we will have a look at public stuff as we go along um depending as an as announcements come up so we we're not kind of closed to opportunities but um we we just it was too difficult to kind of plan that far ahead at the moment without even knowing what would be open um so we'll review that today based on announcements and uh, kind of every three weeks with the Scottish government announcements as well and um, so that's our kind of approach to how we're evaluating those things um, as well so in terms of schools um, the we would in previous years we've had um Mer performers such as ben sparks um <laughs> travel around um at schools and do in-person activities we've had science centers and places do special workshops and special events um a real challenge has been that because i work with a lot of different organizations across scotland although i am not furloughed a lot of those organizations are so in terms of planning even though i can still plan a lot of the people i would plan with um aren't around to to plan so that's that's been a real restriction um for the way that maths week would normally run and um, so for schools we have been planning over the last month um with uh, so my colleague uh, and um education scotland for a blended learning and um, that was uh, kind of confirmed today that uh, schools by the end of September will be a mix of learning at home and learning in schools um, so that's that's the model that we've been working towards um, which means that rather than kind of events in person we will be having a look at trying to create kind of resource sort of resource packs that schools can um, use either whether they're in a classroom or that kids can use at home as part of that um, I would like to I'm, I'm not at the stage of um, sourcing it kind of yet but we have some elements of those live performances so trying to keep a bit of the excitement and something new rather than just kind of another thing that they would get any other kind of school week as well but it has has a special um, feel to it as well um, but kind of working with Education Scotland to make sure those uh, what we're um, uh, what we're kind of sending home is supporting what they're doing in school and supports the model of learning that pupils are doing at that time as well um, and we've always had kind of core competitions as part of maths week which um, have in the past they lend themselves quite well to running during during lockdown or during blended learning um, so we've had the maths inside photography competition which is lovely that works very nicely <laughs> um, and other ones like maths with no borders involves hundreds of bits of paper being posted to my office um, we're having a look at not doing that <laughs> um, but how we can make that competition work um, without just making everything digital what i'm quite conscious to do is that it it doesn't just move um my, to being a digital festival that we keep elements of this hands on nature and we're lucky we've got a longer lead in time to do that um, so that it's it's not all kind of screen based that there's still lots of things for um pupils to do kind of physically and that the resources reflect that mix and the competitions aren't all digital ones that there's still a still an element of creativity for um people in it as well uh, and then some of the things one one thing that we've been building up over the last couple of years is working with stem ambassadors so we've had stem ambassadors we've been doing training with stem ambassadors about speaking confidently about the maths in their jobs um, and going into schools during maths week uh, so we ran trial ones last year and this year i'm hoping to run um digital sessions with stem ambassadors and then work with the stem ambassador hubs about how they can connect um, remotely with schools during Mass Week Scotland. So again, we can kind of keep some of that success that we've built um, this year um, and not just kind of forget about it or, or um, try and try and skip a year with that. Um, so we've yeah, I'm I'm doing kind of a mix of keeping what what's always been core to Mass Week uh, through the competitions and um, things like that, but also keeping getting some new elements um, and, and making it work for a blended learning um, uh, for schools so yeah. brilliant thank you um, i'd be really really interesting to see how that develops particularly as not having everything just digital that's a, a huge thing for accessibility and audiences and things like that so how that sort of 
pans out as you go forward I suppose you've got the benefit of um, working with with teachers and with schools but still reaching all the all the kids that you want to reach is, is challenging yeah and we're um i'm speaking to um local councils that are already doing really fantastic work on um where they know that a lot of their pupils don't have access to digital res uh, to um you know laptops or uh, digital devices that have been every week printing off and putting together resource packs to go out specifically to those families and that's something that um i want to make sure that mass Media scotland can support as well um that, that it's it's not just digital and we we're still trying to reach lots of lots of places brilliant thank you so much katie it's um really really interesting to hear how that's all sort of panning out and that that extra lead time must be really useful compared to what marik is having to deal with um <laughs> yep. We're going to talk to Ashley now, who is the event coordinator for BIG, which is the skill sharing, network, sorry, skill sharing network for people who work in STEM communication. So um, if you are not a member of BIG, I would highly encourage it. I have been involved for too many years to count. Um, and it is really, really useful. It's a lovely community of, of people in the STEM communication uh, community. Ashley has been a science communicator since 2006 and she's a freelancer. She mostly works behind the scenes organising events and festivals and she has been involved in organising the big event which is the main conference for BIG and lots of other things that they do for quite a while now. Um, she usually does all this face to face so her online event experience is basically none at the moment and is about to be a whole lot more because the big event is due to take place in July. Um, so I will hand over to you Ashley. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, hi everyone. Um, so as Sam said, I work for an organization called BIG, which is a members organization, which basically means that um, everything that we do is for the membership. Uh, so unlike Marika and Katie O, our audience is actually people like you. It's people who are doing the communication. Um, so it's not a public audience. It's for people who are doing the communication and the content is actually created by the members. So if you think that, um, oh, I happen to know a lot about online engagement, for example, um, that you could propose a session to happen at the conference in July and then you could share your your knowledge with other people because then you'll go to a different session which is about maybe um, engaging with people who have sensory um, difficulties and and then you could learn about working with you know kids with autism and things like that so we're, we're a skill sharing network um, that's how we work so in a normal situation what we would normally do is we'd have two and a half days of a conference in july and we change venues every year so this year we were supposed to be at cardiff university Last year we were up in Scotland, um, and I think in you know the very near future we're going to be in, in um, Northern Ireland. So we move around the UK as much as possible, and we're in a different location every year. So we'd have two and a half days of events. That's about forty events over the two and a half days. We'd also have social events in the evening. One of our um, the highlights of a lot of people's year is actually the best demo competition, which sees about fourteen people doing live demos, they only get three minutes to do a demo and then the audience votes for whatever they think is the best and it's, it's you know, quite a lot of fun, uh, but it's all in person. So the problem, uh, very similar to the problem Marika was having is that all of our content was decided in January and February before we locked down, before anybody really became aware how, how serious, uh, uh, before it was declared as a pandemic actually. So, um, so our challenge was then thinking about in July, it's the end of July, are we gonna be able to have this event in person still? Is, is that gonna work out? Um, and I think very quickly, luckily, we realized that we're not gonna have this event in person. So let's just stop booking, not that anybody booked anyway, like three people booked tickets, I mean. Um, so we didn't have to worry about doing a lot of refunding and things like that. So at least we didn't have to, that wasn't a problem. But when we were deciding on whether to, to cancel the, the conference altogether or to do something else, we looked back at what our mission was. And because our mission is to, to do things for the members, everything that we do, your membership of BIG pays 
for um, putting on events that will benefit the members. And so we kind of thought what would benefit our members the most and not having anything doesn't really benefit our members. Um, so we thought we'll at least do something, but obviously it'll have to be online in a, in a digital way. Um, and I have tons and tons of event experience. I, all of that is live face-to-face -face in person. None of it is online. I, I do a Skype call with my family once a week, and, but that's it. That's the extent of my online event knowledge. So, so um, like Katie, Katie O, um, our team is we tiny. We have an administrator who does the membership, and then we have me who do the events. So there's, there's not many of us to kind of do and, and to build. Um, so I'm really going from zero to, to fully running a conference um, in no time at all. So that was kind of some of our challenges that I wanted to discuss with the fact that um, financially, as a membership, most of our money to put on the conference comes from people booking, and we would normally have about 200 delegates coming and, and booking the conference. And over the three days, you'd have about 100, and, or you'd have about um, 160 people each day. So 200 people total, but 160 each day. And the money that they pay would go towards putting on the conference. Now, obviously, I, there's very little cost. Um, in, in running an online conference because I don't have to worry about venue hire, I don't have to worry about hiring staff or putting on catering and things like that. So at least that headache is gone, but we will stop to invest in some kind of online software because we had nothing before. Um, but then also, if we're not having live events, our income comes from people booking for those live events. So how long can we run as, as an organization if nobody's paying us to do events um, and nobody wants to spend the same amount of money to do an online event that they would have spent on an in-person live experience. So because it's the membership, we have to think about what's the most responsible way to spend our money so that in a year's time, we're not completely broke and there is no big, which can't support its members at all. So those are the kind of financial challenges we have to think about. Um, on the positives, I'm trying to think about this being just a new venue for us. So we do new venues every year. So online, I'm just trying to look at online as just a new venue. Um, the difference is, is that I would normally have somebody who's based in that venue all the time, who really knows inside and out how it works. I don't really have that this time. So, um, but I'm just looking at it as we're just having it in a different place this year instead of in a physical place. Um, the other benefit that I'm trying to look at, and it's really hard to see the benefits at the moment, but I'm trying really hard to stay positive. The other benefit is the fact that um, I, I think for our content, we can be more specific than we could be if we were doing like a conference. So normally when we were looking at content for the conference, um, we would kind of say, well, that seems really aimed at just people who are university based. And most of the people who come aren't based in the university. So why don't we broaden that topic out to make it more relevant to more people um, who are going to be at the conference. But now, I think one of the advantages of doing it online is that I don't have to be worried that there, this event might only, this session might only interest, you know, 10 people. Um, because that's okay. I, I'm not struggling for space. We can have as much space as we want, you know, if, if you think about it that way. So maybe we could do a, a really killer event for, for five people, but those five people will absolutely love it and they will get so much out of it and it will be really great. Uh, so that's one of the benefits. Um, and the last kind of benefit I'm looking at is, is the fact that we had never done anything digitally before. And one of the things we were thinking about actually coincidentally just before lockdown happened was that um, one, of the, one of the great things about coming together in person is the networking that chance to, to see old friends, to meet new people, to, to do lots of really great networking. But if you were somebody who, um, for, for whatever reason, uh, financial, dis, um, because you, you can't afford to come to the events, or you physically can't get there because of geography, or you have a, a physical limitation, um, you're missing out on that networking. So we were trying to think of ways that we could do networking events online um, and we actually 
got some funding for um, some, to do some accessible things. So we're putting that money towards doing some research on what kind of software and how we should deliver online events that are as accessible as, as possible. So that's going to be, and all of our experience with putting the, the conference all online in July, all of that will benefit us later on so that maybe when we're running um, uh, events, we can say, well, you know what? Before, we would have had to find a venue for this, but this topic maybe doesn't lend itself so much to being in person. We could do it online. And that's never a thing that we, we would have done before. We would have found a place and we would have met in person, um, but we would have been missing a whole segment of people for whatever reason that they couldn't physically be in that space. So, uh, so that's the benefit of online. Um, unfortunately, uh, sorry, unfortunately the challenges are things like people being furloughed because we're all here for professional reasons. Um, some people can't be a speaker because they're furloughed and they're considering this part of their job, or maybe people can't attend because they're furloughed and they're considering attending being part of, of their job. So anyway, there's, there's a mix of um, benefits and, and difficulties that we're just trying to work through.